Why hello there, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages. My name is Mr. Dogboat333, and welcome back to Hearts of Iron 4, the New Order of the Real Naz, the United Kingdom. Last video, we welcomed in the Wallop ministership. Ministry? Well, not quite the ministry, because we don't have any of the uh, ministers really appointed or heads of government or anything like that. Uh, but we welcomed Jared Wallop to, the, uh, to 10 Downing. Um, he almost killed a cat. And he's pretty much purged all the opposition, which isn't s sketchy at all. But what are you going to do other than take a moment to appreciate this moment in time? Now that we have dealt with our immediate problems, the time has come to consider the path we are on. Looking back, the history of our governance under Domville and Chesterton has been far from flawless. It is likely that their brand of fascism contributed to the two uprisings we've had. Lord Wallop has grand ideas of his own to revitalize the English stock. Ideas which would truly see a return to the greatness of days long lost. However, the old guard of the BBP, which he depends on for backing, would be largely appalled by his ideals, and it would perhaps be better to stick with their method for stability's sake. One thing is clear. A choice must be made. And soon. Um. Oh, fucking hell. Um. No, we'll do a tax cut. We'll just... Yeah, we can't afford anything, really. We could try civilian austerity. But... I'd almost rather just keep this up. Because we're still going to get our credit. We need to cut down on inflation anyway and get our growth back up. Oh wait, we can up our consumer goods? This is interesting. Hold on. That's actually kind of useful. I, I did I was this just added? It's like a feature of corporatism or, or, or what? Um. Either way. Um. Yeah. yeah that's interesting. Well, we got a choice. Rain pounded on the centuries-old brick rooftop covering the Prime Minister's office on Downing Street. While kicking his feet up on the desk, explained to himself, I have to clean this office one of these days. The day left by himself. With his only true constant, companions to accompany him. His thoughts. The most baseline predictable of the voices in his head floated the same idea they'd been following and indeed had planned to follow for the foreseeable future, to continue the agendas of his predecessors and finally fulfill the party's decades-old dream, including continuing the process of eventually building the invaluable new English character. But another less familiar voice brought into play an idea that truly piqued his interest. He had the chance to bring about everything he'd ever wanted, the chance to build the dignified agrarian state fueled by a social credit system that he, not the party, had always dreamt of was right there. He needed only to take it. It wasn't as if this idea had no support amongst the party leaders. Lord Tavistock had promised Wallop his eager support for the latter personally, as he was blocked from enacting such legislation in his own time as Prime Minister. Although, just as before, Chesterton and a wire section of the party would be left aghast once they heard of the plans. 
He went back to the first idea, considering that the old guard's legacy would be at risk and could crumble under such a radical change. If he stuck at the party's baseline, he would be able to keep Britain afloat for much longer under his leadership. But that was a false sense of stability. Was that, but was that false sense of stability really worth it when Britain was stuck in the dirt? dirt? And he had the chance to change all of it. I will not let Britain continue to stagnate into the bloody hands of narrow-minded bureaucrats. Mother Nature smiles as the established order breaks. Social credit has proven itself as a feature for England and her stock. The, right, the difficulties we have faced cannot be overstated, and we can rest, rightly celebrate, having overcome them. However, we cannot rest easy on our laws. A courts must be charted. Sighing inwardly, the king would wonder to himself, not for the first time when Wall of Speech would end. He was used to boredom during the Privy Council meetings, which usually consisted of whining about the perceptions of him doing something or other. The dull, clearly rehearsed speech, though, bored him even more. Thank God it wasn't Bedford speaking, at least. A new course set by loyal servants of his majesty and the crown to simply continue as we have is to cast England into the abyss. Now is the time for action. A return of our land to proper English tradition can only be done by decisive leadership from a newly empowered crown, free from the bickering that plagues us at the commons. To that end, this government shall embark upon a number of initiatives commencing with the issuance of of crown credit to the deserving, the revival of proper country traditions, and the investment of vast sums into agriculture. Edward blinks, staring around the room in confusion. The reaction of the men around him ranged from bewilderment matching his own to shocked fury on the face of Chesterton, as well as even excitement in Bedford's case. Had Walt simply made that part of his speech up on the spot, or... <laughs> Lovely joke, Gerald, thundered Chesterton, startling him, but I think it's time we got back to real matters. Walt wears an eyebrow in response for replying, You are about to, f to refer me as Prime Minister Arthur, and can promise you that I men mean every word. <laughs> well, he must have gone ra stock raving mad then. Chesterton snarled, his coarse voice having abandoned its gentlemanly character completely. None of us will support you when you've spat on our friend's grave like this, not until you regain your wits. He stormed from the room, followed by a number of men. Walt watched him go, seeming briefly regretful before shaking his head and resuming his speech. Edward wasn't listening, though. All he could do was sit there, still as a statue, ch ter terrified of just what madness Walt would drag him into. <laughs> God save the king. <laughs> We've broken the final shackle. Look left. Look right. The hills are bright. The dales are light between. Because tis fifty years tonight that God has saved the king. The time to act is now. This is our moment. This is our one chance before it is too late to see our vision through. The lame duck ministries of Domville and Chesterton were clearly shrinking their duties, or shirking their duties, of fulfilling the true vision of a fascist Britain and should no longer be considered as merely good enough. We must now only accept the perfection that we aim for in the days of ministry and the array. Chesterton and Domville were the friends of a nation. However, sometimes bad friends pop up, and in this case, those friends only led to failure. Chesterton and his large group of supporters betrayed the party, but this sudden stab in the back will not stop us. We shall stand strong against their weakness. The wishes of the Duke of Bedford shall be fulfilled, and with the current leadership, the Earl of Portsmouth shall never fail, despite Chesterton's best efforts. Well, we have... Uh, well, the poverty change rate is actually really nice, but GB growth is sucky. Um, a knot of roots is also interesting. Well, what a turn of events. One lonely night in Downing Street has brought forth an entirely new vision for Great Britain. One Gerald Wallop once thought to be impossible. And indeed, many still believe Wallop to have gone completely mad. If he wishes to prove them wrong, then he must ensure that he's not alone in his delusions of grandeur. Like a mighty oak burrowing its roots into the earth, the new Britain can only survive by drawing sustenance from what 
that which is below, or more specifically, by calling upon the strength of his benefactors. Only with the combined support of the BPP, the gentry, and the English people themselves can well make sense of the tangled knots and webs of alliances within the nation and keep it, it hale and healthy, lest it begin to wither away from below. And then we have oak and ash. Of all the trees that grow so fair, Old England to adorn, greater than none beneath the sun than oak and ash and thorn. England has grown sick and blighted, having strayed far away from what she once was, but with the coming of Wallop's new regime, the kingdom may now begin to return to what it once was. The English revival has begun. Like a mighty oak, the revival has many branches, the return to traditional English lifestyle, character and culture being the most significant amongst them. By the time Wallop is through, what was once a sapling will have grown into the most impressive and glorious tree ever known to man, as God wills it. Uh, let me scroll down. We have a negative poverty rate for once. That is actually lovely. Um, I'm actually really happy with that. Funnily enough. Um, yeah. Yeah. Let's off some new uh, ministers. Still have Kim Philby. Which is never not funny for me. We have a new home secretary. Well, we have a new ideology, alright. Social credit. <clears throat> C.H. Douglas, in his description of a model of economics which debt free purchasing powers supply to all citizens, viewed it as a method by which the machinations of the inner circle of high finance could be overcome. Fascists who believe in social credit make the implicitly Explicit identity of set inner circles explicit. They brand financial institutions as both domestic and international as Jewish plots for dominance and seek to overturn this conspiracy with the deployment of social credit. For the social credit fascists, the influence of Jewish bankers begets the destruction of national traditions. Though their market manip through their market manipulations, virtue is made worthless and vice made profitable. The people are thus drawn to abandoning God and country in favor of endless decadence. To these fascists is all but another problem of artificial scarcity resolved by the distribution of purchasing power. By subsidizing the righteous and making virtue profitable through social credit, these fascists believe that they can restore national values from the moral wasteland of modernity. Their critics are many and their po points are plentiful, but social credit is still a young ideology on the world stage, its fascist child even younger. Time will tell whether their dream can be realized or if their delusional voyage will be shattered against the rocks of reality. Social credit is a weird one. I know it had like some supporters across. It had a weird point in Canada where it's pretty popular in like, was it like Alberta, I think. British Columbia a little bit too, but especially I think like Alberta or Saskatchewan, one of those provinces. Um, JJ McCullough did an interesting video that I can't remember at all at this point, but uh, this is not the same. So uh, this is not the Canadian social credit system. Uh, this is a whole different ball game, uh, from what I can tell. Well, let's take a look at our uh, our new cabinet: Hastings Russells, the twelfth Marquis of Tavistock, and the twelfth Duke of Bedford, our Home Secretary. Believe of social credit as well. An abusive upbringing, cold distant parents, compounding his etin humiliations. An abusive life, an equally cold distant marriage, and in ending in ignoble divorcing, divorce proceedings. A history of the far right, founding member of the BPP, member and affiliate of a dozen fascist groups. A prime ministership lost to a mental break. An obsession with social credit, once denied, now unleashed. The Duke of Bedford's story is, in his mind, a great tragedy. His appointment to Home Secretary is its redemption. All the years he spent promoting social credit, all the capital and goodwill he burned to realize even a fraction of its potential, it all might be fulfilled now. And Hastings Russell will pursue his dream with fervor, even if it sends him in all of England into the abyss. And then we have Arthur Bryant, Foreign Secretary. Enter any library branch, pursue the bookcases of the average home, and you will find Arthur Bryant, a famous historian with four decades of experience. Bryant's specialty is the grand history of England, 
a man obsessed with their, the, this past, gravitated naturally towards the pre-war right-wing circles which Jared Wolf also walked. Here he found peers with compatible values, patriotism, anti-Semitism, admiring of Hitler's regime, whom Brian saw as a mystic he helping, a mystic helping Germany find her soul. Despite his admiration, he no longs to return to Britain's Halicon days and knows what holds her back. As well as new foreign secretary, Bryant visits the Reich as a covert agent against the German businesses that have desecrated the once proud England. For so long, Arthur Bryant has written of a glorious past, one in which Britain was mightiest of all empires. God willing, he and Walt shall make them so again. Hmm. This is all interesting to me, I gotta say. Next, we got Rolf Gardner, Chancellor of the Exchequer. Again, a social credit guy. A staunch revitalist of old English traditions and an advocate of organic farming. Rolf Gardner's only economic experience is his espousal of social credit as a cure to England's ills. For years, Gardner has called for British people to return to their once green fields. He looked to Germany, where he saw, in its naturalist movements, the value of earth and breed. Then, Germany looked to England and their industry poisoned. Gardner lamented two decades' damage, but an old friend has come to heal it. Gerald Wallop, a former associate from their kinship and husbandry, has appointed him Chancellor of the Exchequer. With his majesty's treasury, Gardner hopes that social credit shall breathe new life into the countryside. One day, England shall again learn to live by the oak and ash and thorn. Interesting stuff indeed. I picked a stone and named it. Right you guess the rising morrow, and scorn to tread the mire you must. Dust your wages, sons of sorrow, but men may come to worse than dust. Shun the coward, shun the traitor, shun all those who would bring low all that is moral and decent for their own sick ends. That is the mantra of Gerald Wallop's new government. There is no need to make nice with the rabble any longer. All traces of those who oppose the Earl of Portsmouth and his ascension need to be utterly expunged from the BVP. Whether it be Butler and his weak-willed corporate stooges or Fonte and his dim-witted rabble, none who challenge the new government shall be given any quarter. Perhaps the more junior members may be allowed to stay, perhaps not. But with this one fail swoop, a stone shall be cast that knocks away any meaningful opposition to the new Edwardian era. Good enough is the back to go Country blooms, a garden and a grave. Dear Mr. Gardner, Though the decision to appoint you to Chancellor is out of my hands, I still feel as though I am committing a great betrayal in leaving this office to you. The idea of a pagan folk dancer being placed in charge of the Einhardt's back second largest economy is a ludicrous one. And yet, the Prime Minister is committed to this course of action. Regarding economic policies, I have recently taken the time to read C.H. Douglas, and I find his theories so lacking credibility or feasibility that it baffles me why you and Walp are so eager to implement policies which shall do great harm to our economy. It baffles me that an incoming chancellor believes in rapid injection and extraction of money in circulation. It shocks me that you could believe there is such an appreciable difference in the flow of payments made to households and payments to firms. It terrifies me that I have given genuine consideration to retrieving my daughter's old economics textbooks and copying for you the section on inflation. You have at your disposal His Majesty's Treasury, which includes thousands of civil servants and bureaucrats learned and experienced in economics. Were it in my power, I would command you to listen to them and to not nationally pursue an untested, untried, and unsound theory. Instead, I can only ask that you listen to their reasoning and hope that yours runs out. Regards, Rab Butler. It is dismissed. Dismissed without a second thought. Well, we'll have to see how this all goes next time, my friends, because I gotta leave it there. 
Thank you guys for watching, though. If you like this video, if you like, if not, feel free to dislike. If you have any comments or feedback, leave them in the comment section below. I read all the comments I get, and I appreciate any all feedback you might have for me. Check out my various links down in the description box below. Leave me any comments or feedback down in the comment section below. And, yeah, that's about it for now, my friends. I thank you all for watching. My name has been Mr. MrDogBoat333. I appreciate you guys watching, and I will see you all next time. Bye-bye.